So let's talk a little bit about nocturia. You know, this is not a new problem. It is actually an old problem. We've had it for a long time, but now we have some options on this. So the question that I've been asking as I've looked into this, and I've just been looking into it for six to eight months, you know, this is relatively new, again, that we have options. Is it a symptom or a disease? And these are kind of the findings that I've had. So as we talk about this over the next 10 minutes, we'll talk about what it is, why should we care, evaluating the causes of it, how to treat it, and how not to cause harm. And then finally, who, who's in charge of this? Whose bullpen does this sit in? So nocturia itself is defined as waking at night to urinate, with each voiding episode preceded and followed by sleep. Clinically meaningful nocturia is equal or greater than two. Nocturnal polyuria, and frequently we use these, um, these definitions interchangeably, which we really shouldn't. Nocturnal polyuria is defined as nighttime urine production greater than 20% of the total volume output for younger adults and greater than 33% for older adults. It's highly prevalent. We see it a lot. People have a lot of symptoms. That doesn't mean everyone wants to get treated. That does mean that a lot of people have it. The diagnosis rate is very low, and the treatment rate itself is also very low. I don't think I need to explain to anyone the burden of it. Most of us sat through residency, or those of us, uh, a lot of us did, where we were sleep-deprived, and we understand what sleep deprivation means. If we're getting up a couple of times a night, we're not functioning well the next day. As a primary care provider, I see this quite often with patients with productism uh, problems, absenteeism. I'm dealing with an elderly population, and what do I worry about with them? If they get up at night, what's going to happen? They're going to fall. And if they fall, they break. And if they break, the mortality in a male is 50, uh, sorry, 70% in the first year, and a female is 50%. So the burden is quite high. I don't, I don't think I need to explain that to everybody. So what are we dealing with when we're dealing with nocturia or nocturnal polyuria? And, and this is, I, I've kind of put it into my own buckets as I've been kind of looking at this and studying this. We, we look at nocturia caused by BPH. What happens? The prostate's large. It obstructs. We can't empty completely. It takes, we leave 100 mLs in the bladder, 150, 200 mLs in the bladder. If our capacity is 300 to 400 mLs, it doesn't take us long to fill up. We pee a lot at night. Overactive bladder, small capacity bladder, 100 to 150, 200 mLs. It doesn't take us long to fill up. We pee at night. Sleep disorders. You know, people don't necessarily think of that. We think of sleep apnea causing these problems, but sleep disorders will cause this problem. If you're not able to sleep and you wake up, you may think you're getting up to go to the bathroom, but maybe you're just waking up and while you're up, you're going to the bathroom. So that's something we have to clear up. And then finally, there's nocturia due to nocturnal polyuria, which is the biggest form of this. That's what covers about 80%. So when we look at nocturnal polyuria, we have multiple etiologies. And I kind of put this together this week. How do I look at it? Well, we have overconsumption. You know, my, my wife is a perfect example of that. She has a liter of water next to her bed stand. And she asked me one night, why did she go to the bathroom a lot? <laughs> and we have patients who do this all the time. We have environmental causes. We have dysogenic diabetes, which is more uh, um, uh, gestational. Diabetes mellitus will cause this. We have overdiuresis. What happens with overdiuresis? This is third space um, we're mobilizing. We get up at night. We have congestive failure. We lift our legs. It all comes back to our heart. We get rid of it. You can see the rest of the list here. Diuretics are a notorious cause in primary care. Patients come in saying, well, I have this new problem. When did this problem start? Well, I don't know, about six months ago. Did you change anything? No. I went to the cardiologist. I started taking a hydrochloro something. Yeah, and you find out they're taking it at night. So that's overdiuresis. And then there's two little antidiuresis. We need antidiuretic hormone. If we don't get enough for whatever reason, we have two little antidiuresis. So that's the etiologies, that's the buckets that I put nocturnal polyuria in. But then I, I, as I'm reading this and studying it, I, I asked the question of how much does the etiology really matter? How much we void at night, how much does that actually matter here? The etiology of nocturia is multifactorial. As I said before, about 80% of patients with nocturia have nocturnal polyuria. But, and I found this in, in an old paper, regardless of the frequency or cause, nocturia results from production of nocturnal urine that exceeds the capacity of the urinary bladder to comfortably store it. Think about that for a minute. It's a very powerful stating. So if I have overactive bladder, 
I may not have, by definition, nocturnal polyuria, but my bladder can't comfortably control the urine that I'm producing. Same for BPH, same for other issues. So maybe we need to look at that and take care of the patient who's presenting with the problem. So chew on that as I go through the rest of the slides. So as we're looking at the symptoms, it can kind of direct our treatment. Obviously, if a patient comes to a urologist's office or primary care and they have obstructive symptoms, we're thinking BPH and we're treating accordingly. If they're having urgency and frequency during the day in addition to nocturia, we're thinking OAB and we're treating accordingly. What I would challenge the group here is when you're treating this patient, none of these uh, meds for BPH and OAB are actually, are actually indicated for nocturia, and they haven't had studies that prove that they actually work very well. So if the patient has these symptoms and you're treating it and their symptoms aren't resolved, then maybe we need to go back to what I was talking about before. You're producing too much urine at night and you're not comfortable anymore. Sleep disorders, you need a sleep clinic. It's something to ask as we're dealing with nocturia. And finally, if you have nocturia due to nocturnal polyuria, treat the cause. And I'll bring us back to this slide. With nocturnal polyuria, if possible, again, treat the cause. Treat the behavior. I tell my wife, don't have a liter of water next to your bed. All right, control your diabetes if, if you have that. Take the diuretic at a different time. The question, though, is can we treat within this category too little antidiuresis, too little of the chemicals that are going to help us decrease the amount of fluid that we make at night? So when, treat, when treatment calls for pa pausing urine production, I want to emphasize that word, pausing urine production, because that's really what we're doing. We're not changing the total volume of urine you're going to create over a 24-hour period. We are telling the kidney to pause, pause for a couple of hours, pause for whatever period of time. So we're working on the distal, distal tubule in order to, and the collecting ducts, excuse me, in order to pull the fluid out and decrease that nocturnal polyuria. Now, we've had desmopressin for a while, but we're scared of them. We're scared of them because of the risk of hyponatremia. And at th this point, I've had a chance to talk to a lot of specialists, and everybody gives me stories of hyponatremia, hospitalization, and there's always somebody in a crowd that says, I had a patient die who had hyponatremia. And we are concerned about this. So the old desmopressin was concerning. So the newer versions of desmopressin had to be safer. And we're going to talk about the only drug that's on the market right now. So you have a different version. What does the different version mean? It's high, the high bioavailability, which allows for low dosing, and it has a short antidiuretic effect. Antidiuretic effect that lasts four to six hours. You hit a pause on the kidney, which is really important. When you look at the data on it, and this is probably the most important slide. If I only can show one slide of all the efficacy of a drug like this, this is it. If it's working, it's actually decreasing the amount of volume that I'm producing at night, and that's what the studies show. You produce, in, in, in this situation, 800 mLs. If you use the low dose of the Noctiva or the high dose of the Noctiva, you're reducing the volume, which is exactly what we're looking for. So what happens when you decrease the volume that the kidney is producing then the bladder doesn't fill as much. And if the bladder doesn't fill as much, what does that mean? We get more sleep. If we're waking up because we're reaching bladder capacity for whatever reason, if we hit a pause on the kidney, we're slowing down the urine production, we're getting more sleep. But there's fears. We have historical fears about desmopressin, and everyone will say hyponatremia, and that's the 300-pound gorilla in the room. So let's think about that. When you look at the studies, again, go back to what I sh shared before, high bioavailability and a slow window, four to six hours, what happens to hyponatremia? Are the lower doses safer? And the clinical trials that are published actually show that they are. If you look at the low dose for the serum sodium concentration, zero in the danger zone, five in the higher dose, and when you divide that out, it was in the older patients. When you divide it out further... Of the five people that went into the danger zone, four were males and four were on glucocorticoids, which are contraindicated on this. So if you actually worked, did the appropriate placement or the, used the, the uh, I'm sorry, you, you kept the, uh, the drugs out of it that you weren't supposed to use, you probably wouldn't have had the problem. But when you look at the relative risk, it's very low. 
And this is all said in the, product, in, the, in the product insert, and I thought this was very important to, to share. Don't use it if you have hyponatremia or history of it. Don't use it if you have polydipsia. Don't, you could read the rest of that. Don't use this if you have congestive issues. Why are we worried about that? Because if you're pausing the kidney, you're causing an increase of intervascular fluid. If I have a patient with congestive failure who swells up at night and they put their legs up and it's all rushing to the heart, now I'm telling the kidney to pause, I am not doing the right thing. That is bad. So it's, in the, it's a contraindication. You want to be careful with that. And if you use it and use it appropriately, it means you monitor it. What are we worried about? The 300-pound gorilla in the room. Again, with full desmopressin, we had a bigger concern. With a modified, we don't. So how do you monitor this? You check your sodium, which in a primary care setting is something we do all the time. We check electrolytes in every disease state, or well, every appropriate disease state, should I say. So this is pretty easy. Check the sodium at day zero, at day seven, and then day 30. Now, after that, it's periodic. But we have protocols for this. For example, if I'm using hydrochlorothiazide, I'm checking potassium every three months anyhow. If I have a patient on Coumadin, I'm checking levels. If they're a diabetic, I'm checking an A1C. So these are very simple things to do to keep us safe. So as I'm winding down, the question is, what, does any specialty own urine? You know, does, is it a urologist issue? Is it a primary care issue? Is it an internist, a nephrologist? And the answer is no. And Dave helped me with this yesterday as we were talking yesterday morning. The reality of where we are with Nocturia and where we are with medication is this is a perfect opportunity for shared care. And I put the telephone there as an encouragement to call me. Call your primary care doctor. Your primary care doctor should be calling you because urologists and primary care must work together as a team on this. See, what I need you to do is help me see if this is a problem with the bladder or the prostate, which is your, your forte. That's in your bullpen. If it's the kidneys, it's a medical problem. That's my forte. If you call me up and say, Matt, you know, I've been working on this. I've treated the bladder. I've treated the prostate. I think this is a way to go. Can you monitor this? Can you help me with it? Then it's a thumbs up. I'm happy to do it. Or if I call you and say, I'm trying this, but I'm thinking this, let's work together on this. This is a perfect thing for shared care. This is a perfect thing to start in the urologist's office if you're concerned, but make that phone call to the primary care doc. Let us do that lifting for you because that's something we do anyhow. So when I look at what I've studied now over the last six to eight months, what do I believe? I believe that adequate treatment of nocturia requires shared care. We're, we're in this together. And we're in this together to help the patient. And the patients who are suffering for this can be helped for something that we weren't able to help them for or help them with before. I want to go back to that line I mentioned before. Regardless of the frequency or cause, nocturia results from a production of nocturnal urine that exceeds the capacity of the urinary bladder to comfortably store it. Let's put their ability to hold urine and empty urine at the forefront here. And if we need to slow down how much urine their bladder is getting, we hit the pause button. And that's all we're doing. For a four to six hour period of time, we're hitting the pause button. And the final thing, and I think this is extremely important, nocturia, whether it's a symptom or a disease, is, doesn't matter. What we're looking at is choosing the patient who, who's bothered by it. So I want to thank you and ask what do you believe for the future direction in the treatment of nocturia?